living God. Let's continue to worship God, amen. Set in the atmosphere, let's praise him. Amen. Let's continue to worship as in God. too good and so we really need to pray for Laura Fields. Let's believe God for healing in her body. We want to pray for Sanisa, Chris, and the Reese family. All of these need God's uh, grace in their lives, salvation. Let's also lift up uh, Joey. Uh, he's got a court date on Tuesday so he needs God's favor. Believing God to intervene for him and everything would go well. And then let's also pray for Jerry and Carmen, Bob and Raul. Uh, they all have cancer. They need a miracle of healing. We want to lift up today together Joe Ruelas, who needs healing. Let's lift up Mary, also needs healing from pain. John needs healing. And then Emilio and Alyssa need to be saved. And then Yvonne needs healing. 
in our body. Amen. Let's lift up our fellowship, our leaders, Pastor Greg Mitchell, Sister Lisa Mitchell, the Presbyterian Church. Let's lift up our mother church in West Las Vegas, uh, Pastor Lamb, Pastor Looney, Pastor Smart, their wives, their families, and the congregation, especially as uh, the Pioneer Rally is this week there in Vegas. So, uh, let's pray for all of us that are going to be traveling there and back uh, for safe travels. Uh, let's pray for the services. Uh, ministry through our leaders that God would speak to us, uh, stir us for his will, be praying for that Pioneer Rally later this week, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And let's also remember our Southern California leadership, Pastor Rich Cox, Sister Brenda. Let's pray for all of our sister churches, uh, both here in the States and also overseas. Uh, we want to pray for all the couples, all the families and congregations. Uh, today we're going to lift up uh, Tyrese and Cheyenne Martin in Kansas City, and then uh, Julio and Giselle in Madagascar. Let's pray for these couples, their families, their congregations, that the Lord would bless them, uh, add to them, give them increase. These are both uh, brand new pioneer works. So let's pray that God will give them fruit. We want to pray for our nation, our country, our president, our military, our first responders, God, to bless them, to help them as they serve and protect our communities. You've come this morning with a need in your life. You want to signify that by faith with an uplifted hand. We're going to lift our voice together, church. We're going to ask God's grace upon us. And then when we're done praying, uh, Brother open, uh, Brother Wendell will open us in a word of prayer. God, we worship you, God. We worship you, God. God. We pray that you would just have your way in this place, God. Stretch forth your hands, God. Oh, God, you are holy, God. Shando, ro, bo, 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 bo. Yes, God. Oh, Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for the opportunity, God, to be in your presence this morning, God. God, we're contending, God, God, for miracle signs and wonders, God, throughout this service, God. God, we're praying and lifting up every prayer petition, God, spoken and unspoken, God. God, that you will move behind the need of your people, God. God, we come desperate, God. God, what a hunger and a thirst for more of you, God. God, we pray, God, upon the man of God, as he ministers your word, God, a fresh anointing, God, that your word will go forth, God, piercing the hearts of your people this morning, God, bringing them to an altar of repentance, God, an altar of surrenderance, God, that your will will be done in this place, in Jesus' name, amen. Welcome out this morning. Greet one another. Say hello to somebody. Hello. Good to be in the house of God this morning. We welcome all of you out. 
here to the Potter's House Christian Fellowship Church. Uh, visitors, amen. Those of you that are here for the first time, uh, we're glad that the Lord brought you this morning to be a part of our service, uh, and we especially welcome you, amen. Maybe you uh, couldn't make it in person, but you're watching on live stream. Uh, we're glad you're tuning in. We hope to see you next time in person, amen. Just some announcements, some things we have up and coming. Um, Wednesday is our um, midweek service, uh, our regular service schedule. So every Sunday morning at 11, every Sunday night at 7. So we will have uh, evening service tonight as well. Man. And our midweek services are 7.30 uh, every Wednesday as well. So take note of our service schedule. Um, God will bless you as you're faithful to his house uh, and uh, allow him to have his way in your life. And I mentioned the Vegas Pioneer Rally that's coming up this Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Uh, we're encouraging everyone that's able to make it out there uh, to go. Uh, this is our mother church. This is the church uh, that launched and planted and has supported this church uh, all of these years. Uh, and so uh, many leaders are going to be there. Uh, Pastor Lamb, my pastor, uh, Pastor Stevens, Pastor Greg Mitchell, Pastor Campbell. And so if you're able to get out there, even if it's just uh, uh, one or two days, uh, It'll greatly enrich and bless your life. Uh, if you have any questions uh, on uh, any accommodations, you need help getting there, staying uh, there, let me know. Uh, we want to help in any way that we can. But it's going to be a great time. Uh, and everything's going to be live streamed. So if you're not able to make it uh, in person uh, this time around, you can't get the time off or just can't hack it, watch on live stream. WLV Potter's House. Uh, all of the live stream uh, services will be taking place there. Amen. Amen. All right. And then just looking a little bit ahead, um, March 2nd, we're going to be helping out the Bakersfield Church. Uh, so keep that in mind. That will be an all-day outreach to go help out that church uh, to be a blessing to that congregation. Uh, and then also the 26th the 27th of, of February, Pastor Paul Stevens is going to be in the Linwood Church ministry. And so he's a leader. We're going to open up those nights uh, to be able to not only support the revival, but be blessed uh, by one of our leaders' ministry. And so keep those dates in mind. Amen. All right. That is all the announcements we're going to make. We're going to receive the offering of the morning. Uh, let's give God praise as the usher comes. God, we love you and we thank you uh, for your blessings in our lives. Uh, we give you glory, praise, and thanks uh, in Jesus' name. We have many ways to which you can give. You can give a cash or check made out to the Potter's House. Uh, uh, or you can give directly from your device. You can give uh, uh, through Zelle. Or you can give online at our website. We have QR codes up there on the screen uh, that you can use for your convenience. So we appreciate your generosity. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 27, verses 20 through 21, Command the people of Israel, mark that, Command the people of Israel to bring you, he's talking to the priests, to bring you pure oil of pressed olives for the light. To keep the lamps burning continually. The lampstand will stand in the tabernacle in front of the inner curtain that shields the Ark of the Covenant. Aaron and his sons must keep the lamps burning in the Lord's presence all night. This is a permanent law for the people of Israel. It must be observed from generation to generation. So we're talking about the tabernacle. The tabernacle was the place where God would meet with mankind. It's representative of God's presence. And in this tabernacle, there were a lot of items. There were a lot of pieces of furniture, all of them symbolic uh, of things here in the New Testament and under Christ. Uh, but there was something called the lampstand. I don't know if you've seen the menorah, the Jewish menorah. They would light that, uh, and the light would be shining continually, never going out. And it was the priests, the Levites, Aaron and his sons, it was their job to keep those lamps burning, as it was symbolic of God's presence. But God says, I want the people to supply the oil to keep those lamps burning. 
And as I read that, I thought about our responsibility as the people of God. Lots of people, when they see an established church, they'll say, well, it's a well-oiled machine. But in order for that to happen, it has to be the people who give, who contribute the oil to keep things going, to keep the lamps burning. Our church is a beacon of light and hope in a dark place of Los Angeles. So, but in order to keep that light burning, church, the people, you, have got to contribute. you got to give. You have to keep the lamp burning. Amen. And we do that by giving our tithes, our offerings, our pledges, uh, contributing to what God is doing uh, so that this church can continue to function, uh, so that souls can continue to be saved through this ministry. Uh, and so let's take the commandment from God to heart and be obedient. Uh, let's bring our oil to keep the lamp burning of Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, we're going to ask God's blessing on both gift and giver. As you give tonight, or this morning rather, God bless you for that. Brother Wendell is going to pray. Oh God, we thank you for the opportunity to give unto your kingdom. God, let us give in obedience to God, God, and believing in you, God, and seeing the need, God. God, we pray that you will bless your gift and giver this morning. Amen. Prison King. Righteousness is God, who is like a appreciative of your ministry. We're going to go to the book of Proverbs, chapter 11. Proverbs, chapter 11, in the Word of God. Proverbs is a book of wisdom. We are going to receive some wisdom from the Word of God this morning. I've been doing a series on uprooting rejection. And we're going to continue that series. We've been looking at how rejection, the disapproval, the rejection that we receive from others, from our upbringing, from life itself, how it's affecting all of these different arenas of our life today. And we looked Wednesday at Rejection and marriage. And I believe God is helping our marriages. But this morning, I'm going to look at another arena. An arena that we probably don't think much of when we think of rejection. But that is the issue of rejection and money. Rejection and money. We're going to read this out of Proverbs chapter 11, verses 24 through 26. It says, there is one who scatters, yet increases more. There is one who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty. The generous soul will be made rich, and he who waters will also be watered himself. The people will curse him who withholds grain, but blessing will be on the head of him who sells it, the word of God says. Father, we're asking that you would... Minister to us today, God. We break down, God, the walls, God. The God of rejection and pride, we're asking that your word, that your spirit, God, would go forth and bring deliverance, God, in this arena of our finances, God, how rejection is keeping us from your blessing. I'm praying that we would leave a people of faith trusting in you as our provider. God, I'm asking you in Jesus' name. God's people say, Amen. So let's think about rejection and money and the connection between money and emotions. You see, money is more than just math. 
It's more than just data. It's more than just I have needs, and I got bills, and I need numbers in my bank account to pay those things. Money is a lot deeper than that. Money is emotional. It's closely connected and attached to our emotions. Many times we make choices about money based on how we feel at the current time. Money also makes us feel certain ways. How do you feel when you ain't got money? How do you feel when you do got money? That tells you how closely linked our emotions are when you got money or when you don't have money. Yep. Produces a feeling of joy or a feeling of depression. Now rejection affects our emotions and our emotions are attached to money. So the only logical conclusion is that rejection can have an influence on our finances. Whether that's pain, whether that's confusion, whether that's worthlessness or anger that's come upon us as a result of rejection in our lives, it's going to affect how we handle money. You see, your emotions affect your viewpoint this morning. You see things based on how you feel. It affects our perspective. And in this case, it affects how you view money. So what's the purpose of money? How is money to be used? Well, our text tells us that there's one who scatters, yet increases more. And then there's another one who withholds, but they lead to poverty. So let's think about rejection and withholding. Because what we're talking about here is the issue of fear. Many of us, we have this emotion of fear that's attached to our money. Some people, perhaps you grew up in poverty. You grew up in a in a upbringing with financial instability. You didn't know if the rent was going to get paid. You didn't know if the lights were going to be on. You didn't know if you were going to come home from school and all of your stuff was going to be out on the yard because you got your family got evicted from its apartment. Uh, yeah, there was instability. And instability produces fear in young people, in children. Turmoil. Things getting repossessed, things getting taken away. Uh, what am I? Life's gonna, the rug's gonna get pulled out from underneath me. Some people, they grew up in a home where there was conflict over money. Parents were constantly fighting over the issue of money. Uh, what did you do with that money? Uh, uh, you know, why are you spending on that? Uh, why did you blow that money at the casino? Uh, you know, why did you do, you know, arguments, uh, conflict uh, all over money. And so this produced an obsession with security. We come out of this thinking, you know what? I have to take care of my future because no one else is going to take care of me. And this is not based on wisdom, but it's based on fear. We come away thinking, I don't ever want to feel that way again. I don't want to ever be uh, impoverished again. I don't want to ever feel that insecurity again. So I'm going to do everything I can to take care of myself. Exodus 32, 23 through 24. Aaron said to Moses, the people said to me, Moses led us out of Egypt, but we don't know what's happened to him. So make us gods who will lead us. So I told the people, take off your gold jewelry. And when they gave me the gold, I threw it into the fire and out came this calf. These people are former slaves. And this mindset, uh, a slave mindset, uh, right? Not a son, not a daughter, but a slave mindset uh, is I got to take care of myself. I can't depend on anyone to take care of me. You know, Moses, he led us out of Egypt. Uh, he's been leading us all of these years, uh, but he's been up in the mountain for a month and a half. Uh, who knows if he's ever going to come down. Uh, and so let's just go to plan B. This type of person may struggle to tithe. Struggle to start tithing to begin with. You might be here and you're struggling to give 10% to God. 
as God commands. There's a reason, and it's rejection. It's fear. Maybe you started tithing, but then bills came up, and then you stopped tithing. There's this fear that God is going to let me down. Yeah, I'm going to obey God, I'm going to give God, but God is going to let me down like everyone else has always let me down. God's not going to come through. God's going to put me in a position where I'm vulnerable and I'm insecure again. Even beyond the tithe, there's a struggle to obey God, to give. What if I don't have enough later? What if I, I can't pay my rent? What if I can't pay my bills? Uh, what if I starve to death? They don't break that fear. They miss out on the blessing of God. Never get ahead. Right? Think of the text. The biblical scripture is saying the one who withholds it, thinking, I got to hold on to it, otherwise I'm not going to make it. They become impoverished. That leads to poverty. This type of person hates to spend. What if I don't have enough? Verse 24, there's one who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty. You know, if money is causing conflict with the people that we love, then there's a problem. If at the center of many arguments, many fights, many blow-ups, whether that's with our spouses, whether that's with our children, whether that's with our parents, whether that's with whoever we're living with, our relatives, if this issue of money is causing conflict, there's a problem. Now, we're not talking about, you know, surprise spending without consultation, right? It's not like, you know, you wake up one morning, you look out the window, hey, honey, I bought a boat. What the heck? You bought a boat? You know, how much was that? You know, we're not, we're not talking about extravagant spending. Yeah? But if any time we discuss the possibility of money getting spent, of having to buy something, it leads to an argument? It's a war? Well, maybe there's an issue. And it's this very issue of rejection that we're talking about. If money is causing intense emotional responses and reactions, right? You know, you can, you can talk about all of these different arenas, but the moment you touch money, just like in church, let's talk right now. Yeah, you feel that? Feel that tension? I could talk about anything else, but you touch money. Oh, why is that? Well, that just proves it's not just ink on paper. It's not just numbers in a bank account. Money is spiritual. Jesus talked a lot about money because money is connected to so many other arenas and is connected to this issue of rejection. An extreme version of fear as a result of rejection manifests in hoarding. You ever met a hoarder before? The, you know, you could drive down the street of any neighborhood. You're generally probably going to see a hoarder living on that street. The, the hoarder is the one that says, I got to hold on to everything. Yeah, but it's all junk. Yeah, but I might need it one day. You never know. I might need this wood wedge thingamabob thing next time I'm working on the car, honey. You never know. I might need this. This is good stuff. Maybe I could sell it on eBay. I might be able to get money. Right? I got to hold on to it. I, you know, I, This is good. I might need it later. If I let it go, I might suffer. This, this is fear. This is rejection. This is intense fear at work. Rejection and spending. Some are the exact opposite. They view money as a way to fix their negative emotions. So I feel crummy. I feel rejected. I feel worthless and no good. But if I have money, then I can spend it on nice things and make myself feel better about myself. There's nothing wrong with buying nice things. It's that second part that will make me feel better about myself. That's the problem. It's when the money and it's when the spending is the means of giving me this joy that I'm longing after. But money doesn't produce happiness. Money doesn't produce joy. 
Sometimes it causes more problems. Some use money as a drug, a way to escape their problems. I'm sad, I'm stressed out, so I'm going shopping. <laughs> Maybe my problems will go away with the thrill of buying something, having a, you know, some, some new clothes, having a new gadget, a new phone. If I have something new and nice, that'll make, make me feel better about myself. Some use it as a medicine, trying to heal a negative emotion that's on the inside. If rejection is an assault against your worth and your value, then to some people, buying things is what is used to try to produce a feeling of value. I wear designer labels, so I'm worth more. I have designer bags. I have a swoosh on my shoe. That means I'm somebody. <laughs> my car is a high dollar car, so I'm worth more. I buy my kids stuff that they didn't have, that I didn't have as a kid, so therefore I'm making them happy if I'm buying them stuff. I gotta throw a big, huge party. That's gonna make me all happy. That's gonna make me happy. It's gonna make everybody happy. There's nothing wrong with throwing a big, huge party. But once again, it's when that, the stuff, the money, the spending, that is what's going to produce the joy and the happiness we need instead of God. Some people use money as competition. It's called keeping up with the Joneses. Oh, the neighbor's painted their house. Let's paint our house. Oh, the neighbor's got a new car. Let's get a new car. Competing. Oh, they, they have decked out Christmas decorations. Let's deck our house out even more. Why? Oh, because we're somebody. We have more worth. We have more value. We're better than that person. Why? Because you got more stuff. Let's think secondly about money and a poverty mentality. Rejection is an opinion of our worth or our value. We get that from other people. This is what we're talking about in this series. We've received rejection, whether that be from our parents, whether that be from our spouses, uh, whether that be from an ex-boyfriend, an ex-girlfriend, uh, maybe a coach, uh, a parent, uh, somebody in authority. Uh, you know, that's, that's what the rejection came from. But it's, re it's destructive when we accept that opinion of rejection. We were told we're worthless. Uh, we were told we're no good. Uh, we were told we don't belong here. Uh, but then we accept that rejection. We agree with it. Uh, and that uh, is what gives us these problems. Think about how rejected people view money. Some rejected people, they have a guilt syndrome. People who have been told that they don't deserve anything. That they'll never amount to anything in life. But then they get some money, they can buy some decent things, they begin to succeed, but then this causes inner turmoil. Why well, shouldn't have this? I shouldn't succeed. Because I'm nobody, I'm worthless. That's not the will of God. Proverbs 10, 22 says, the blessing of the Lord makes one rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. They can't enjoy the blessing of God. They feel compelled to give it away. They sabotage their blessing even because they're guilty. <laughs> the second manifestation is the poverty syndrome. These are people who have accepted the rejection. They feel they have no worth. They feel like they have no value. And so they have to live financially in such a way that matches the way they feel. This is a poverty mindset. Everything they have has to be low class. Everything they have has to be trashed, broken, junk. Because that matches their opinion of their worth. Even anything nice they get, gets trashed. I've seen people with a poverty 
mindset with this curse at work, which comes as a result of rejection in their life, they get something nice. They get a house, they get a car, or somebody blesses them with something, and then within six months, it's like trash. The, the engine blows up in the car. The couch, you know, has got, you know, cat doo-doo all over it, you know, dogs peeing on it, right? And this was my grandma's side of the family. I'm telling you, they had this issue of poverty. My mom's side of the family, there was, you know, all types of animals living there. Sometimes it was hard to tell between the people and the animals. But it was just like, I, I remember my cousin's boyfriend was sleeping on the, on the couch and a cat just came up on his chest and just dropped a turd. And then just walked away and then he's just still sleeping. And this, this place has so many cucarachas, bro. Yeah. <laughs> My dad bought the house later on and he tried to fix it up. But, you know, here, here's one for Alex. The bug guy had to come five times to bomb the place. There were so many roaches. There was big old tarantulas up in the attic that were feasting on those roaches. My dad said the next morning after they bombed it, uh, it, was like, it was like fall had come. Like, you know, there's dead leaves everywhere. No, it wasn't dead leaves. It was dead roaches blanketing the ground. But there were people living like this. They're, they're, they're just sitting there drinking their coffee, and roaches are just crawling over the place. It's like, how's it going today? How's it going You know? Why would somebody live like that? Well, we're talking about an extreme version of what I'm talking about. Extreme rejection, extreme abandonment, extreme insecurity. And this is one of the things as I grew up, uh, you know, I, I saw this and I wondered, man, what, what is that? But as I got older, and especially as I became a pastor, uh, I started realizing, you know, I'm starting to know the history of the family. Rejection, abandonment. This is all we deserve. We're worthless, and so everything we have is worthless. Everything we live in is worthless. Rejection was causing a poverty mindset. So let's close. And let's look lastly at a healthy view of money. Let's look at the road to financial health. And if Brother Wendell, if you wouldn't mind helping me with my little illustration here, if you can lay all those out on the top there. First of all, we need to be healed of whatever pain is affecting our viewpoint. And I'm going to show you a little bit of an illustration, and I want you to think long and hard. What is keeping you from tithing 10% of your income? And I'm going to illustrate this. I have here 10 little potatoes. This is perfect. Ten little baby potatoes. They're not the big Russell potatoes. They're just little. So let's pretend I'm a farmer. And I harvest potatoes. And here are my ten potatoes. That I've harvested. Right? We're not farmers. We, we have jobs. But just pretend every potato is a dollar. Because all a tithe is really. Is just one out of ten. That's all the tithe is. One dollar out of every ten dollars. And so my tithe to God is one potato out of ten potatoes. Now let's say you ask me for one potato. Let's say Wendell says, hey, Pastor, I see you got ten potatoes there. Can I just have one potato? I'm hungry. I would like to eat a potato. And I look at him and say, oh, yeah, but if I give you this potato, how am I going to eat? How am I going to live? How am I going to get by? And Wendell's looking like, dude, you got nine other potatoes there. Yeah, but if I give away this one, I'm not going to make it. And this is what rejection tells you. You can't just give God one potato. Ten percent, that's it. But the rejection saying, no, if you give that one away, you're not going to make it. But it's a lie. I got all, I got all these potatoes left over. But I can't just give one away. 
there's an issue there. And I don't believe for Christians that don't tithe, the issue is, well, we just we just hate God. Right? We're just shaking our fist. God, you want us to tithe? You want my money? Yeah, you can stick it. No, I don't think that's what Christians are thinking. I think it's this issue of fear. We're afraid to give it because of this issue of rejection. And so what most Christians do, because most Christians do not tithe, most Christians, studies show, give 2% of their income. They, they, they don't give one potato. They give a fraction of their potato. And so this is what we do. We come to church and we think, well, I need to give something. And so, here we go. All right, God. Here you go. Here's a fraction of a potato. It's just 2%, 3% of my, God, thank you. Thank you for giving me your whole life, shedding all that blood for me. Is this enough? This should be enough, right? Well, it's just a fraction. It's not a lot. I mean, we got all this for us. What is it? It's fear. It's rejection. We're afraid that God's not going to provide for us. Because we take it a step further here. God says, listen, if you just give me one potato, I'll give you so many potatoes, you won't even know what to do with it. Uh, you'll have potatoes coming out your ears. You'll have so many of them. Right? He says it, Malachi 3.10, go read it. Bring the tithe into my house, and I will pour out blessings so much you can't even receive it. God gives us a promise that if you just give me one, it's really, it's not like God needs our one potato. It's not like God's like, hey, man, can I get 10% of your income, man? You know, I'm like really strapped for cash. No, that's not what it is. It's a test. Will you trust me? Will you trust me as your heavenly father to provide for you? But if we don't trust God with one potato, it's because we got deeper issues, church. We got rejection issues. We got trust issues. We can't trust God. We can't trust him as our heavenly father. And I believe God wants to break that in us. He wants us to understand that, that we, we, can, we need to be healed from this fear and this rejection. And we need to learn to love and to trust God. Listen, you can trust your Heavenly Father. He will take care of you. He will bless you. He will take care of you. Now listen, I've been doing this for a long time. And there's been some hard times. There's been a lot of months where I didn't know how I was going to pay the rent. But my God is faithful. And he always provides. That for me, the tithe is non-negotiable. You know, I, I don't even care if my expenses are like this uh, and my income is this. Uh, I'm still giving the 10%. Because God's going to make a way. I trust him. Do you trust him this morning? We need to be healed of whatever's affecting our viewpoint of God. Secondly, we need to form a correct view of our worth and our value. Your worth and your value does not come to how much money you have in the bank. It doesn't come to what kind of clothes that you wear. Your value and your worth is based on God, who God says you are. God says he loves you. God says you're his son, you're his daughter. Therefore, you have value. That's where your value comes from. Hebrews 13.5 says, keep your lives free from the love of money. Be content with what you have because God has said, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. Thirdly, we need to begin to see money correctly. Money is a tool. Money's not a god. Money's not an idol. It's just a tool. Just like a hammer. What do you use a hammer for? To pound nails. Money is a tool. What do you use money for? To give to God? To support? To be a blessing? To pay your bills and all your expenses? You can use it to help in life. God's kingdom. Yourself. Other people. Our text tells us that there's one who scatters their money, but yet they increase more. The generous soul will be made rich. The one who waters will he himself be watered. You can use your money as a tool of blessing to your life, to your family's life, to the lives of other people, to the kingdom of God. You know, God does not mind his children being blessed financially. Don't believe the whole vow of poverty mindset. There's this whole mindset. Maybe you were brought up Catholic and you were 
drilled this mindset into you uh, that it's spiritual to be poor. Oh, we're just poor. We're just humble people. We're poor people. We're humble people. We can never have money. We can never have nice things. Uh, that's a lie. That's rejection talking. That's an orphan spirit. No. Our God and our King and our Father has got a lot of money. We're sons and daughters of the King. We're royalty. Right? Prince Charles ain't walking around in rags. Right? He ain't riding his bike right now because he, he's part of a royal family. You're a part of a royal family. God wants you to be blessed. He wants you to enjoy that blessing. And he wants you to use that blessing to be a blessing to other people. Abraham was very rich, the Bible says. He was the richest man in the world practically at the time. Paul even said, I've learned to abound and I've learned to be a base. He said, you know what? There's times where I had money and there's times where I didn't have money. And he's like, you know what? But I'm content through them all. Romans 8.32, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Now, I'm not preaching a prosperity gospel, but I am talking about the blessing of God to unlock into your life. And thirdly, the key to financial health and prosperity is generally releasing your money. The generous soul will be made rich. The one who scatters increases more. Blessing is on the one of those who sell it, who give their grain out. It's in the release. We release to God our tithes and our offerings. The result is blessing. We give to people. We're blessed by God. This is why Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. There's more of a blessing when you release, when you give. And there are people here this morning as we wrap this up. There's a spirit that's keeping you back from this. It's causing you to miss out on this blessing. You're afraid to give. You're afraid to tithe. And it's fear. It's rejection. It's a poverty mindset. It's an orphan spirit. And God the Father wants to deliver you. He wants to fill you with the Holy Spirit, which is the spirit of adoption. He wants to unlock blessing into your resources. And by the end of it, the more you learn to trust God, you're not just giving God one potato. You're giving God two potatoes. You're giving God three potatoes. And then God drops 300 more potatoes. And you're like, okay, God, here's 10 potatoes. And then you're almost like playing, start playing this little game with God. <laughs> and God's like, oh, yeah, you want to outgive me? Okay, here's more blessing. And, you know, and, and you use a spoon to give, and God uses a shovel to give it back. And then you use a shovel, and then he uses a forklift to give it back. This is how it starts working. Because God's just looking for sons and daughters who will trust him. Do you trust your Heavenly Father this morning? You trust Him with your soul. How many believe you're on your way to heaven this morning? Why? Because you believe, even though you're about to, you know, one day you're going to enter into an unknown realm of death. How, anybody ever died here before? Nobody's ever died before. You've never died before. But you trust God to meet you at the place you've never been before and preserve your soul and take you to heaven. You trust the Father with something so precious as your soul. But you can't trust him with one potato. I like every head back. Every eye closed. We'll just let that one sit. Amen. There's people here, you're not saved, you're not born again, you're not right with God. But God's Spirit is drawing you. Money is a spiritual issue. And that's why even in the midst of a money sermon, you're feeling the conviction of God. And it's not to judge you, it's to help you realize how much you need God. 
You need his love. You need his help. You need his presence in your life. And he's here to help you. God is here to help you. He's here to save you. He's here to forgive you. You may have came in here with a lot of shame, with a lot of brokenness, with a lot of pain. Maybe you've been battling some addictions. You've been living a life you know is not good, it's not right, it's not healthy. There's a God in heaven that loves you. He gave his only son Jesus to die for you and shed his precious blood for you. And today you can be saved. You can be forgiven. You can be set free. There's hope for you today. You can enter into a new chapter. You can enter into a new life, a new beginning. You say, you know what? I want that. I want to pray. I want to receive Christ. With heads bowed, with eyes closed, no one looking around. If you would like our prayer, just signify that with a raised hand. Say, yes, pray for me. Who would there be? My brother, thank you for your, your hunger, your honesty. You can put it down. Who else? There's others here. You say, here's my hand. I want to join this honest heart. Who would there be? Not saved, not born again. Maybe you're backslid. At one time, you used to follow Jesus. At one time, you used to trust your Heavenly Father. But something happened to where you stopped trusting Him. It could have been some kind of event, some kind of trauma. It could have been an offense. The devil lying to you. Maybe sin. You know what? With a lot of people I've seen, it's that whole idea of, well, I can't trust God to take care of me, so i got to take care of myself. Oh, I can't, I can't make it to church because I'm too busy working. Because Lord knows God can't take care of me. i got to take care of myself. That's an orphan spirit. That's a rejection mindset. And maybe you backslid and you wandered away. You know, you started working more hours and you get diverted and start missing one service. Easier to mix the next service and keep missing them. Next thing you know, your nose is back in sin. You're back in places you don't belong. And there's hope for you, backslid. Be reconciled. Be redeemed this week. Signify that with a raised hand. Say, yes, pray for me. Amen. Our brother raised his hand. I'd like for you to do one other thing, brother. So slip out of your seat. Come on down, man. If you look up at me, come on down here. Just want to pray with you, man. Just want to pray. Sinners pray with you. for his goodness. Thank God for his grace. Church, we're talking about rejection and money. You know, as I was looking at this sermon, studying out, you know, I started to realize that and I believe this is the case for, for most Christians. that don't tithe 
Because there are a lot of Christians that don't tithe. This is true in all churches. There's a very small percentage of people that actually tithe faithful. And that's the case for our church. So it's a small group of people. We need more tithers. We need more people who love and identify with this church to start becoming a faithful tither. But what I've come to realize is, you know what? The issue is not that we're so greedy. God, we just love our money. The issue is not, God, we just, we're, we're resisting and defying a God. God, you can't have none of my money. You know, the issue is, it's fear. That's the issue for the majority of Christians, it's fear. Why are they afraid? Because they don't trust God. They've been rejected in life. Rejected by their father. Well, my father didn't provide for me. I was raised by my mom on welfare. My father wasn't around to take care of me. So why should I trust my heavenly father to do that? Well, because your heavenly father is not like your earthly father. He, he, he goes on record to say, no, I will provide for you. Well, you know, I was rejected. I experienced all these various things in life. How can I trust that if I serve God, the rug's not going to get pulled out from underneath me? Because God says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. And God wants to challenge people at this altar with the issue of trust. And I'm especially speaking to people here. You're not a faithful tither. But you're going to come to this altar and you're going to say, you know what, God? I repent. Forgive me for not trusting you. I'm going to start becoming a faithful tither beginning today. Maybe it's hard for you as a faithful tither to go beyond that. God wants to help you to look to embrace and, and be filled with more of his love. Because the Bible says in 1 John that perfect love casts out fear. So if you're afraid to give the offering, if you're afraid to give in the pledge, if you're afraid to give to the world of Angela, it's, 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 you need more love. You need more of God's love to assure you that he's going to take care of you. Because he will. Amen. These altars are open. I encourage you to do business with God as we sing out this song, Heart of Worship. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come. Longing just to bring something that's a word. Oh, come before your father as his son or daughter. Yes, I'll bring you more than a song. For a song in itself is not what you have required. Oh, you search, Lord. You search much deeper within. Through the way things appear, you're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. It's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you. King of endless worth, no one could express how much you deserve. Though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours, every single breath. I'll bring you more than a song. For song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear. And looking into my heart, oh, I'm coming back. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. It's all about you, oh, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it. When it's all about you, 
It's all about you, Jesus. Let's give God praise to you. This right here, this is what needs to inform our thinking. There's so many promises in this Bible. God goes on record to give us promises. God says, I promise, I promise, I will, I will. And we can trust in his promises. So I'm believing that as we take this to heart, we will experience the blessing of God. Amen. We're going to close. We're going to ask God's blessing. Come on back tonight. Amen. I don't know about you, but when I go to in and out how many love in and out And I'm hungry. I don't go for the single. I go for the double. Double, double. Animal style. So you might even get rid of it. Do a three by three, four by four. But you know what? Why don't you go for the double today? How hungry are you for God? That's what it really comes down to. We don't have these services, you know, that we want to control. No, it's just, the question is just how hungry are you for God? That's all. You want a double today? You go for a double-double, the Holy Ghost. Because tonight I'm going to be preaching another message on rejection. And it's a very, very important topic. Very important topic. And it has very important application to us, our, our city. God's going to speak to us tonight. So, if you're able, and if you're hungry, go for the double today. Amen. We're going to ask God's blessing. And, and uh, Brother Alex, if you close us in a word of prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, God, we thank you this morning, God, for your wonderful word, my God. God, we just ask, God, let us take this, God, trusting, God, that our faith will be enlarged, God, in these areas, my God, that you would bring breakthrough, God, breaking the spirit of poverty, God, from our lives, God, the spirit of fear, my God, God, that this will be a prosperous church, my God. Thank yes. you, God, I pray for each and every one of us, God, for traveling mercy as we go, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.